people in Japan have been wrestling with the consequences of using nuclear power ever since last year's accident at Fukushima Daiichi. They focused on the safety of the country's 50 reactors. They've also debated the future use of atomic energy. Now there are concerns about the byproduct of the nuclear process, highly radioactive waste. NHK has learned top scientists are going to urge the government to rethink its final plan disposal for this waste. We've obtained a draft proposal by the Science Council. Right now, utilities store the waste in stainless steel containers. They're about a meter long and almost half a meter wide. Each one weighs half a ton. The government says there are approximately 235,000 of them in all. The nuclear waste inside is a glass-like liquid, so it's solid. Because of its dangerous nature, it needs to be stored away from people and the environment. No shit. The government decided on its final disposal plan, 12 years. Crews would bury the uh, waste deeper than 300 meters underground for tens of thousands of years. But members of the Science Council are questioning that idea. Their draft proposal says science has its limits and that Japan's frequent earthquakes and active volcanoes make it difficult to identify areas underground that would stay stable for such a long period of time. No shit. They say the government should re-examine its disposal plan, even if it means restarting discussions from scratch. You know, geology matters with existing operating plants, but geology matters also with repository siting, for instance, that kind of thing. Um, but the, the back end of the fuel cycle is broader than that, and probably many of you are aware that we are now dealing with the waste confidence decision. Um, uh, judgment and ruling out of the circuit court now at the uh, at the NRC and I'm not able to say a lot about this because it's an active adjudic adjudicatory matter but let me just say that we know this is a pressing issue it's a priority for us at the Commission we are now at the Commission level looking at a staff uh, document which is laying out some options for going forward we will deal with that promptly and we will have a plan to move forward quickly. So that's, that's sort of where we're going with, the, with that. And, and there will be other issues that will come up as well. Um, I think, especially out of Fukushima, we're also paying more attention to spent nuclear fuel and issues associated with that. And then my fourth and final um, goal for, for the agency is to improve communication. Uh, an agency like ours, an independent regulator doesn't do well with the public and ensure public instill public confidence unless we communicate well. And my, you know, my initial impression is uh, of reading NRC documents is that some of them are rather opaque <laughs> and they're full of acronyms <laughs> um, that are really difficult to figure out. Um, there's no LOA no list of acronyms associated with them. Um, yeah, it's funny, when I say LOA to people at the NRC, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Wow, it's an acronym. You don't, you know, don't have a clue. So, um, so anyway, I've been, uh, I've, I've, every time I get an opportunity to talk to the staff, I've been emphasizing this to them. I think it's important both internally and externally for us to be much more transparent with our communications. You know, I read these documents and I sit there and I imagine a grandmother who lives near a nuclear power plant trying to, you know, slog through some of these documents to understand what some of the issues are. And I, I just wring my hands. It's like I think about grandmothers trying to open bottle tops sometimes when I can't open them, you know. How do they get the bottle top open? I don't know. Um, so, uh, so anyway, we need to make sure that we communicate effectively with the public so that the public can have confidence in our work. What's so funny now? I sometimes just think funny things. That's another very important area of focus for us. And, you know, there are, there are a number of issues that will come up at plants, that have come up at plants. We will continue to, to maintain our focus on that. I've been very impressed with the staff at the NRC. They are a strong group of people. Um, happy to debate the issues, and, uh, and I'm convinced 
that their main goal is also ensuring public health and safety. Wow. But the, the problem at this point is not really figuring out what the cause of the, the explosion is, but where in the world is, is the, the melted nuclear material that is in the, the plant right now? Uh, but un unfortunately, we, we have no way of, of uh, figuring this out. If it was, a, for example, a coal power plant, uh, at this point we would be able to go in and, and touch the material and look at it more closely and figure out what's going on, but um, that's not the case with this kind of power plant. Uh, but because the, the, the plant is a nuclear plant, we can't go in and we can't take a look and we have to, there's nothing we can do at this point. Um, and the gentleman who said that uh, we can't call this an accident is absolutely true. Um, it's not an accident. Uh, it was something that was absolutely predictable. But even though it was predictable, there was nothing, to, nothing done in order to uh, measure what the consequences would be or anything of that matter. Uh, so like I said, w we have no idea where the melted nuclear core is at this point. And I just want you to imagine uh, the, the core is made out of uh, ceramic. Uh, it's the same material that you use at home with your plates and cups and things like that. Uh, and can you imagine, can you melt that with, uh, by adding heat to it? Uh, that stuff you can't uh, melt unless you have 2,800 Celsius of heat uh, uh, put to it. They're, they're saying that it indeed melt, and the, the amount of materials that are in there, the ceramic material, isn't just like one plate or one cup like you have at home, but it's a hundred tons of it. So this 100 tons of uh, ceramic material melted, coated, and the vessel that, that it rests in is made out of steel, and that of course melts with, with that kind of temperature, so it fell through that too. So where did the melted material go there? It fell into the, the containment uh, vessel. And what is that made of? Also steel. But what TEPCO has been telling us is that underneath that steel, there's also a, a, a floor of cement, and that cement hasn't melted yet. But it's not as if TEPCO has gone there and seen if this is the case or anything like that. It's basically ba based on uh, calculations that they claim to have worked out that way but I don't believe it for one second. There's at least a possibility that it's gone through uh, all of it and, and leaked into the, uh, into the ground. Uh, when something like that happens, there's a strong possibility that it leaks into the environment and of course into the ocean that's, that's right there. And I've been advocating since late, uh, last May that uh, a big wall be built underground to prevent that from uh, entering the, the rest of the environment. I actually really hate politics, um, but I've, I've approached uh, uh, several politicians about this and, and convinced them that this is actually something that's very necessary. But uh, unfortunately, neither TEPCO or the Japanese government has uh, moved on, on this proposal. Uh, that's really all I know at this point. Uh, I really hope that uh, something is done so that the material doesn't spread to the, the greater environment, and I'm going to do all I can do to uh, prevent that from happening. Cleanup workers are reporting a surge in debris washing ashore along the Alaskan coast. They believe a large part of the waste floated there after the tsunami last year in northeast Japan.
A group called the Gulf of Alaska Keeper has been tracking its cleanup activities since June. The non-profit organization compared the amount of debris washed up this year with last year. Workers collected debris near the city of Anchorage. They say the quantity of waste had increased in four locations facing the Pacific. The amount at one location was four times higher. Members of the group say they found polystyrene foam as much as 39 times the amount found last year. They say many pieces of waste have Japanese writing on them. The group plans to provide the data to the U.S. government and the state of Alaska to help them develop measures to deal with the debris.